for the introduction. As, as mentioned, my name is Peter Fetchy. I, I am a neurosurgeon over at Duke University, uh, where I also uh, run our brain and spine metastasis center and our, our brain tumor neurotherapy program. Uh, I do have some disclosures, uh, Monteris Medical and Synaptive Medical, which are two uh, technology companies that work on the neurosurgical side. Uh, these are not relevant uh, disclosures for this particular talk, but uh, in the uh, spirit of full disclosure, uh, I do do some work with both of those companies. I want to begin with just kind of a, something that everybody here, I think, is likely familiar with, uh, and it's the kind of haunting statement for us at this point. You know, there, there remain currently no FDA-approved immunotherapies for GBM. Uh, and a lot of the things that we've seen success with in other tumors, even on the brain metastasis side, uh, like checkpoint blockade, have really failed for the most part in phase three trials. Uh, you know, obviously there's been some recent promising developments uh, with notions from, um, you know, out of UCLA, this the concept of potentially neoadjuvant checkpoint blockade, but that still remains fairly unproven in, in, in advanced phase trials. And, and really a lot of the failures I think that we can discuss, because there's plenty to discuss in GBM, are attributable to what I would describe as essentially a wasteland uh, of immune responses in these patients. And, you know, this picture, if I can get it to remain in your minds of what the immune landscape truly is in patients with GBM, this is really one of the most immunosuppressive of solid tumors, which is ironic because it, it really remains confined to the central nervous system. It rarely metastasizes. So one has to question what the selective pressure, if you will, is for this tumor to be so immunoevasive. Uh, and it's potentially that it would be fairly immunogenic outside the CNS if it couldn't exert such systemic and local immunosuppressive impact. Uh, but the fact is that if these immunotherapies that we are continuing to deliver uh, are not delivered into an altered environment from our perspective, in other words, if we don't work to counter that immunosuppressive environment, I think we should expect to see some of the same failures. So our group continues to work on trying to understand, in particular, T-cell dysfunction, because I think a lot of us still believe that the T-cell effector arm is going to be uh, a, a highly necessary arm if our, if our immunotherapies are to work. Uh, we've really worked to try to characterize some of the T-cell dysfunction we see in these patients. Uh, this was a review uh, we put out uh, just a, a couple of years ago. Uh, Carolina, who was a grad student in my lab at the time and is now a pathology resident uh, at Duke, uh, having done her MD-PhD with us, uh, put out a really, I think, nice division of, I think, a modern framework for understanding T-cell dysfunction in glioblastoma. And what we really did was, to be fair, is we borrowed and stole from the basic immunologists who had been looking at these divisions in T-cell dysfunction for many years, and we categorized dysfunction in glioblastoma along those lines so we could really develop mechanistic insights as to what the sources of such dysfunction were, and we can make sure that we were describing things uh, properly as well. And unless we're going to do that, it's going to be very hard to properly address and reverse such dysfunction. So what are those modes of dysfunction? Well, most, most simply, they, they divide into the five different categories you see listed here. Uh, and although we do work or have done work in the past to look at each of these, uh, and you can see some of the figures from those papers kind of uh, explaining a little bit pictorially what, what some of that dysfunction looks like, what some of the mechanisms may be, the purpose of this talk will really be to focus on the latter two that you see uh, boxed here, exhaustion and ignorance. And that's where we've focused a lot of our efforts uh, of late. And that's what I'd like to kind of report on today is where we've seen some advances. Uh, so returning to work by the same graduate student uh, when she was in the lab, this is a paper we had put out recently talking about T-cell exhaustion. Uh, and so we'll explain a little bit about what exhaustion is. Uh, we'll highlight some of the big things from this paper, but then talk a lot more about some of the directions that we've been focused on of late. So what is exhaustion? Um, it's kind of what it sounds like, you know, T cells that, uh, uh, first off, I mean, in, in order to be exhausted, you kind of have to be active first, and it's the same for T cells. They have to have been activated to become exhausted. And once that activation occurs, uh, it's probably under suboptimal conditions, but there's a distinct transcriptional program in activated T cells that uh, essentially leads to a, a very hierarchical and stereotyped loss of effector functions. Uh, there's uh, upregulation of immune checkpoints and variety of inhibitory receptors. And you can find even a single cell RNA sequencing fingerprint for an exhausted T cell that's very easy to track. Uh, it was initially characterized in chronic LCMV infection, uh, but of late there's been increasing uh, notions and characterizations of exhaustion in cancer and other disease model states as well. 
to be fair, it, it truly is a an adaptive or host adaptive mechanism for limiting destruction to tissues by T cells that otherwise might be overly active. And in the brain, one can understand why exhaustion might limit immune destruction in that environment. Uh, and it really becomes, in the case of infection or really tumor as well, this kind of host pathogen stalemate that results from T cells being able to kind of keep things in check, but not necessarily clear an infection. Uh, and the idea then again is uh, as noted to limit collateral immunologic damage to surrounding tissues. Uh, in the case of cancers, if cancers are in some way able to elicit T cell exhaustion, that of course is a cancer adaptive mechanism for limiting the capacity of T cells to clear the tumor. So one of our first purposes in our, in our studies was to make sure that the dysfunction that we were seeing amongst T cells that had, su had successfully trafficked to this brain, to brain tumors uh, and then were effectively shut down by those tumors, we, we had to prove uh, that this was actually truly exhaustion, bona fide exhaustion. So what are the components of bona fide exhaustion? At first, you have to demonstrate a, a very specific decrease in functionality. You have to show the kind of express expression of inhibitory receptors that one might expect to see. Uh, and we also worked to then show that the molecular signatures that we saw in T cells were exactly those same signatures that the immunologists had been seeing in LCMB infection for many years. And so I won't walk through all the experiments we did to do that. You'll just have to take me at face value that we, we did in fact demonstrate that this was bona fide exhaustion. But beyond just simply demonstrating and characterizing that exhaustion, we found some interesting things when we looked at GBM in particular. So Number one, uh, T cell exhaustion was particularly severe in glioblastoma. So uh, we looked at exhaustion in a variety of tumors. We looked in uh, CT2A and SMA560 gliomas. These are murine syngenetic tumors. Uh, and we looked at EO771 breast cancers, B16, F10 melanomas, and Lewis lung cancers uh, that were placed either subcutaneously in the flank of mice or into the intracranial compartment. And you can see these heat maps in panel C here. And what you'll notice is that the glioma models, whether they were subcutaneous or, or intracranial, produce a particularly hot uh, uh, picture of exhaustion. And so gliomas do seem for some reason uh, to produce a particularly severe mode of exhaustion. The other important thing that came out, and you can kind of get that sense now looking at these panels in A and B, is that every single tumor produced a very significant, uh, very specific signature uh, with regards to exhaustion. In other words, there were more than one ways to skin a cat, if you will, uh, but the same tumors produced the same fingerprint for exhaustion each time they were implanted. And more importantly, it didn't really matter whether those tumors were placed in the brain or the flank. Wherever you put them, they produced very much the same exhaustion signatures. And it suggests that there may be convergent ways to get to exhaustion and perhaps not a single mechanism and each tumor may elicit different strength or modes of uh, initiating the exhaustion um, progression. But in either event, uh, we were able to show that GBM in particular uh, elicits a pretty severe mode of exhaustion, which for those of you who've been working in immunotherapy and glioblastoma for a long time are perhaps not surprised by. I think also relevant is that in the time that we've been doing this work, uh, John Weary, who's really, I, I would have to say, the godfather of exhaustion work, uh, he's at UPenn. Uh, he and others have put out a lot of work now uh, demonstrating that really there's kind of a stage-like progression of T cells that have been activated through something called progenitor or intermediate exhaustion, depending on how you want to look at it, to then a terminally exhausted state. Uh, and there's differences in the markers that characterize each of these, and there's differences in the functionality of the cells that might characterize each of these states. And the important component here or characteristic here is that it's the progenitor exhausted cells that appear to be or retain responsivity to immune checkpoint blockade, i.e. if you've progressed to terminal exhaustion throughout, uh, then you really have, you may have difficulty in responding to therapeutics. Whereas if you remain in the progenitor state, uh, of exhaustion, those T cells remain capable of responding. And you can understand then what the corollary is to this is that we would like to understand what is most prevalent in GBM. Is there a rescuable state to the T cells there? And can we focus on preventing that progression from either T cell, activated T cell to progenitor exhaustion or from progenitor exhaustion to terminal exhaustion? And so that's really where we've begun to focus our efforts uh, and that has started to yield uh, some fruit. Uh, so I'll just talk a little bit about some of the characterization that we've done. It's important to understand that uh, in the last couple of years, really the, the exhaustion story has grown more complex and the types of T cell differentiation states that have been characterized are numerous. Uh, we want to understand more about what those T cell differentiation states are in glioblastoma, where they are most prevalent, i.e. spleen, lymph node, blood, tumor. Uh, 
uh, as well as the time courses. Where is exhaustion initiated? Does progenitor exhaustion begin to arise in the lymph node uh, at the time of T-cell priming? Or is it not until later when a T cell then arrives at the tumor and starts to see its antigen uh, post priming in the context of IE infiltrating macrophage or DCs, et cetera? And so those are the things that we're beginning to look at and trying to understand. Uh, we do, in fact, see, uh, you know, just kind of a, from a 10,000 foot view here, that the various stages of exhaustion, which you can see pictured here on the left, uh, exist in C2A tumors. Perhaps not surprisingly, terminal exhaustion is the most prevalent mode, uh, which may in fact un, uh, reveal why there's such a poor response of these T cells to checkpoint blockade. Uh, but there are progenitor exhaustion cells there that in theory would provide fodder and fruit for response. And so we're really looking through single cell RNA sequencing and other modes uh, to try to characterize where those cells are, what's the time course, uh, and what are some of the interactions they, that may initiate this exhaustion process so that we can have reliable targets. Uh, I do have another grad student in the lab now who has really taken over and, and taken the torch for this. Uh, and we've also begun to look at CD4 exhaustion. We've just written a review on that that some of you may have seen. Uh, that's another graduate student who's gone that direction. But on the CD8 side, we're really trying to understand the relative roles of tumor and microvironment in eliciting exhaustion. Uh, as noted, establish that time course on the site for exhaustion, determining interactions and mechanisms as well as delineate tr the transition from progenitor to terminal exhaustion uh, and derive the strategies for its reversal. So we, we talked about these different modes of dysfunction and I talked to you about exhaustion. Uh, I do want to now move into ignorance, which is this other area that we're very interested in. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, a paper that we published a few years ago on this, uh, this idea that T cells in the case of glioblastoma and also intracranial tumors of other types can become sequestered in the bone marrow and thereby lose access to the tumor where they are meant to do their job. Uh, and it's important that uh, if we think about T cell ignorance to understand that there are a variety of components to ignorance and they all make sense if you think about them. But what we're really going to focus here is one where T cells are trapped in some compartment where they cannot access their antigen and thus remain ignorant to it. And our observations here began with the long-standing notion that patients with GBM uh, demonstrate significant lymphopenia. I think many had attributed that to the various treatments of chemotherapy, steroids, radiation. But really, you know, we had found, as had others perhaps, that that lymphopenia really preceded treatment. Uh, and so we found that patients with GBM had essentially AIDS level CD4 T cell counts in many instances prior or at the time of diagnosis prior to treatment. Uh, the same was recapitulated in mice with GBM. So on the left, you're seeing CD4 and CD8 counts from patients with GBM compared to controls. You see marked reductions uh, and then untreated uh, treatment naive patients. And on the right, when we wanted to try to understand uh, you know, what was going on, we found that patients and mice with GBM all had very small thymuses and spleens. You can see spleens pictured here from mice. So there was a retraction of immunologic organs, lymphoid organs. Uh, yet the one spot that T cells didn't appear to disappear from was the bone marrow. And we noticed this in mice with GBM uh, as well as patients with GBM. And so large numbers of basically naive T cells for the most part, but thymic educated, so not single, uh, not double positive, but single positive naive T cells could be found sequestered in large amounts in the bone marrow. And we did show that it was a sequestration event. I'll not go through that here. But I think one of the most important findings is that this only occurred when tumors were found intracranially. So whether we put gliomas, breast cancers, melanomas, or lung cancers in the brain, we saw the same phenomenon. And whether we put any of those tumors, including gliomas in the flank, we saw no such phenomenon. And this suggested to us that there was perhaps a novel mechanism of immune privilege whereby an inflammatory process in the brain would initiate some type of event that managed to keep T cells out. And on an interesting side note, we see the same such phenomena in instances of stroke, uh, albeit it's transient. It lasts, it peaks at about seven days and then disappears. Uh, and we can even see minor blips of this in traumatic brain injury. So I think we really do have some evidence that this is actually a mechanism of CNS immune privilege. Mechanistically, this centers around the loss of S1P1 uh, from the T cell surface. This is a receptor that typically serves as an exit visa, permitting T cell egress from uh, lymphoid organs, including bone marrow. The loss of that T cell receptor, or that loss of that receptor from the T cell surface, mediates their trapping in the lymphoid organs. This is kind of a schematic. Uh, S1P1, when present on the T cell surface, allows T cells to leave lymphoid organs and traffic to the uh, lymph or bloodstream, where they are in seek of the um, uh, ligand for the receptor, S1P. When it hits the ligand, the receptor is internalized. 
uh, those T cells then traffic back into lymphoid organs and cannot leave until the receptor recycles back to the cell surface. Uh, in the case of GBM, uh, what we noticed is that there's uh, essentially a loss of a variety of lymphoid organs, but there's not that loss of bone marrow. And uh, we hypothesize that there must be some type of downregulation or loss of the receptor from the T cell service that was meeting their trapping. And that is in fact what we found. Uh, and I will not go through those details, but I will say importantly, is that when we were able to genetically stabilize S1P1 on the T cell surface, it permitted those T cells to escape. Uh, and although that did not have a survival benefit in and of itself, perhaps not surprisingly, it did allow T cell activating therapies such as 4 BB agonists to now suddenly work quite a bit better. Uh, and then when you add anti-PD-1 on top of that, you can see the, the very nice extension of long-term and median survival. Unfortunately, no drugs currently exist for stabilizing S1P1. And as you may recall from the mechanism discussion we had there, we want to maintain this receptor on the T cell surface, which means that we also can't touch that receptor with its ligand or anything that might be an agonist. So much more uh, in, uh, importantly, we need to find ways to, to target the internalization machinery. Uh, we're very lucky, uh, and uh, there's been quite the coincidence for us that S1P1 is a G-protein coupled receptor. It is a pain in the ass to work with, I will not lie. Uh, but fortunately, in the next building for me here at Duke is Bob Lefkowitz, who won the, G the uh, Nobel Prize for discovering G-protein coupled receptors. Uh, and so we've formed a very nice collaboration. Uh, he uh, knows a lot more about G-protein coupled receptors than me or anyone else in this world, as one can imagine. And so it's been an excellent partnership in devising a therapeutic strategy for maintaining G-protein coupled receptors on the TSL surface. And we've tested a variety of targets of the internalization machinery. Uh, and unfortunately, because these patents are uh, are pending, I, I guess I'm not permitted to discuss specifically the target, but there's an isoform 2 of our target that uh, when depleted uh, through knockout models conveys a very, very substantial survival benefit in intracranial CT2A gliomas. And you can see it here, simply by knocking out our target with no additional T cell activating therapy, we get basically 50% long-term survival um, to uh, intracranial CT2A glioma. Uh, and so of course, that would suggest in simply freeing T cells with S1P1 stabilization provided no survival benefit, that the mechanisms of action here are much more than simply reversing T cell sequestration, and there are additional immune benefits. Uh, uh, I think as further evidence of that, we know of course that it's intracranial tumors that elicit the S1P1 loss and T cell sequestration, but the knockout of our target here restricts tumor growth in subcutaneous CT2A where sequestration does not occur, and you can see marked restriction of the C2A tumor growth in the blue curve at the bottom here when we knock out our target. Some other interesting bits. Uh, so it's not just gliomas. Whether we put lung cancers, breast cancers, or melanoma into the brain, we get 40 to 80% long-term survival. Uh, it's the breast cancers in particular that we see 80% long-term survival consistently simply by knocking out our target. Uh, and when we do this in subcutaneous tumors, again, with lung, breast, and melanoma tumors, we get substantially uh, reduced growth of those tumors, just as we saw with subcutaneous glioma. The survival benefits of this knockout are average when T cells, uh, either CD4 or CD8, interestingly, are depleted, which doesn't necessarily mean that the mechanism works through T cells, but does certainly imply that there's immunologic mechanism that requires them. Uh, and uh, as further evidence that T cells were important here, the knockout synergizes with both 41BB agonism, where we get 80% long-term survival to intracranial CT2A gliomas, uh, or anti-PD-1, when we treat those mice, we get 70% long-term survival to intracranial CT2A. Uh, we are in the process of and, and have actually successfully created a T-cell specific knockout for the target, and we are beginning to experiment with survival curves there to understand whether the mechanism is dependent uh, or mediated through T-cells. And of course, most importantly now, uh, we were, are, have been in the process of developing a drug as none exists uh, to inhibit uh, this target with the hopes that this may be a, a novel cancer therapy that we can test. Uh, we began with screening uh, thousands of compounds uh, went through a variety of assays to find um, compounds that specifically bound to and restricted our target, uh, which is specifically the second isoform. Uh, we had six acceptable compounds come out of that, and we performed PKPD studies now with those uh, to produce one lead hit that has an acceptable uh, PKBT uh, 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 profile. Uh, and so uh, this LKF26 uh, that we've uh, enabled it, that's for uh, uh, Lefkowitz, Kazai, Fetchy, the three collaborators, uh, uh, has demonstrated a very nice stability profile in vivo uh, and actually has a nice half-life of about an hour and a half, which would suggest that twice daily dosing uh, might be appropriate. Uh, 
Uh, we have partnered with industry now to begin doing uh, IND enabling toxicity studies as well as to form analogs of this compound that might be more stable and or more effective. Uh, and the hopes, of course, is that within the next year or two, I mean, I'm trying to be optimistic here, uh, that we would have something that we might be able to bring to phase one clinical trials. So what are our next steps here? Uh, scaled production, of course, of the compound, building analogs, partnering with industry as we discussed, uh, and uh, of hopefully bringing this into uh, first animals, of course, and, and next patients. Uh, and so again, I wanna leave you with this uh, one notion. We, we really wanna turn this wasteland into more of a happy place uh, for the immune system in GBM. And, and I think our group really continues to work uh, on trying to uh, take that wasteland and, and produce a spot where the immune system can flourish. And we'd really like to see some successful immunotherapeutic developments in GBM in the coming years. But it really is crucial to understand that we cannot simply do the same things we've been doing and hope for success. We need to alter our approach and understand the immunologic limits that we're facing uh, and find ways to fix them. So, oh, I'm supposed to go to the end there, thank you. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank uh, everyone that's a member of my lab, all of our key collaborators, all of my funding sources, uh, and of course the audience for your uh, attention and happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Peter, for this fascinating talk. Uh, very interesting. So we have one question at the moment and I'm sure there will be more. So someone is asking, uh, so saying fascinating talk, thank you very much. I may have missed that, but how exactly is GBM modulating S1P1 on T cells? <laughs> Um, that's the question. Uh, you're, you're spot on. You did not miss it. Uh, I didn't put it there because the simple answer is I don't know. Uh, however, as you can imagine, there is a, uh, a very significant arm of my laboratory aimed at understanding that. We have some hypotheses, we have some hits, but I, I couldn't give you the correct answer. Uh, I think it's going to be complex. Uh, what I will tell you is I don't think that S1P1 per se is the target of the GBM's activities. I think it's collateral damage, if you will. I think there's a global loss uh, or a global dysregulation of G-protein coupled receptors that occurs. And, and I think that our target of interest may be some of the mechanism there, but we are in the process of actually testing that. And you have certainly uncovered the million dollar question is how do you get from tumor to uh, loss of uh, S1P1, or for that matter, to shrinkage of lymphoid organs uh, and kind of more global immune dysfunction. Uh, and I think that those are really the interesting questions, and, and certainly our group is very interested in those uh, and actively engaged in trying to answer them. And we absolutely welcome collaboration for anyone who's interested in, in uh, helping us out with that. Okay, thank you. So I have a follow-up question to that. So you mentioned that S1P1 inhibition will then also, you know, potentially reduce lymphoid organs and so on. And I can imagine that if you do this, administer something like this systemically, then um, this will result also probably in redistribution of T cells systemically. So what do you expect in terms of that? Do you think can this be, can it have side effects that are unwanted? Did you explore anything in this direction? Side effects with regard to what? Sorry, I didn't hear that last part. Uh, whether you have, sorry, so I was basically ask, asking whether you expect any side effects from redistribution of T cells. Yeah, so it's interesting, you know, a lot of people, it is a redistribution of T cells. And so some people ask, you know, why is it the bone marrow specifically where these T cells accumulate? And part of it's because we really see loss of these other lymphoid organs. So even if T cells are an increased number there, the shrinkage of the organs uh, overall reduces the absolute counts. So it, it may be relative and proportionate. Um, it's interesting that there's a, there's a genetic knockout for, or there's a genetic model in mice where mice lose their secondary lymphoid organs. It's called alymphoplasia. Uh, and in those mice, S1P1 takes over a larger role in mediating egress from the bone marrow. And I think it's not a coincidence that our patients and, and mice with tumors look somewhat like these alymphoplastic mice. Uh, we have not begun investigation into understanding if, if the mechanisms that uh, beset in alymphoplasia also affect patients, but I can tell you that it's loss of something called NF-kappa B inducible kinase. And so we're interested in that, of course. I do think that redistribution of the T cell compartment, which ultimately still, just so we're clear, it's not that 
the movement into the bone marrow fully explains lymphopenia. So I want to be clear here. There's still an overall total loss of T cells from these people and from these mice. Uh, but there is a shift. And I will note that I get the question very often, do you see opportunistic infections with patients with GBM? And the answer is absolutely yes. But people, I think, for a long time have attributed that to things like steroids, chemotherapy. But just for, for giggles, we kind of went back through the records at Duke. And in the last 20 years at Duke Hospital, um, recognizing that this is likely to go underdiagnosed, fully 25% of the PCP pneumonia cases in the hospital could be attributed to patients with GBM. And that is something that really does go underdiagnosed, uh, but there's no mm -hmm. doubt that there's opportunistic infections. And I'm also not saying that it's the lymphopenia that we see here that's responsible, because there's no doubt that once you start treatment in these folks who are already lymphopenic, they're gonna reach even lower nadirs after dexamethasone and, and temozolomide. Uh, and so if you look at, in fact, we did that, and we looked longitudinally, 93% of patients with GBM over time will become markedly lymphopenic with an average kind of lymphocyte count of something like three to 500, you know? So, you know, it's, it's, not, um, it's not just this, but the fact is that we're pouring it all on from multiple directions. And unless we fully understand that, um, we're our, our open, our opening our eyes to it, uh, I think that we're missing an opportunity to alter our approach immunologically. Absolutely, yeah. So another question that I have is more basic biology, I guess. So um, I know that, um, so you have found that basically only when you implant tumors intracranially, and it doesn't matter from which type, you see the sequestration in the bone marrow, but not when you implant them subcutaneously. Yeah. So what happens when you have simultaneous intracranial and extracranial tumors, like it's the case, for example, in melanoma and breast cancer patients? Yeah, great question. We we have uh, actively opened an IRB study here to study that um, and try to understand that. And it's it's complicated for all the reasons that you say, because ideally what you really need if you're going to look at the metastatic population is you need that 10 to 15 percent of patients where their only presentation of disease initially uh, is, at least on imaging, uh, is a brain metastasis, um, which is tough to find, because otherwise uh, the extracranial disease is a confounder, of course. Um, so, but no, I, I think that question's spot on. We're trying to study it. It's not the easiest phenomenon to kind of isolate the variables with. Uh, certainly we may be able to manipulate that more in mouse models, but I think your question is, you know, clinically in patients, what do we really see? Uh, and if we see bone marrow sequestration, can we really attribute it to the intracranial disease and not any systemic disease that is by definition most likely present even if we don't see it, yeah. Okay, thank you, yeah. Okay, so we have another question from the audience. So, Simone is saying, great work, thank you. Do you see an increase of T cells in the brain upon knockdown of your TI2 target? Yes, we do. Um, we see a, a bigger increase in the functional T cells, in the activated T cells. It's not that we get global or widespread increases overall, it's just that there's a shift in the increase in numbers to things that we want there. But I can tell you that the differences aren't substantial enough to make me believe that it's increased trafficking that's really doing this. I think there's just a much more, uh, so far what we're seeing is that there's a much more prevalent just kind of globally improved immune function uh, than it is necessarily just trafficking, which it also goes to the point of, I don't think it's simply kind of freeing T cells from the bone marrow and getting them to the brain that's really making the difference here. I think it's multifactorial. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Peter. That was very fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay.